Hey guys, uh, it's Ollie from Rad Season. I'm excited to be joined today by food advisor and founder of uh, Crystal Clear Kids and Crystal Clear Nutrition, uh, Crystal Heasley. Crystal, thanks for coming on the Hello. show. Hello, thanks for having me, Ollie. It's great to see you and catch up again and Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year. Uh, and wh wh whereabouts are you at the moment, Crystal? Are you uh, are San home Diego. In okay. Yeah, San Diego, California. And what's what's the situation like at the moment? How, how's everything going over there? Uh, well, the lockdowns are back into effect again. So unfortunately, a lot of small businesses are suffering, but it's a very active lifestyle community. People are still getting out and surfing and going to the beach and hiking and things like that, which is great to see because that's what you know, essentially improves our immune system and improves our energy levels and uh, gives us a fighting chance to beat any colder virus that comes up. So albeit things are a lot quieter and there's not as many festivals and concerts and outdoor things, um, people are still getting out and doing their thing. That's cool. That's good. That, yeah, that they can still get out and yeah, go like yeah. go down and sort of like run, hike, get out for a surf yep. and stuff. That's great. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. Well, um, I'd love to take it back uh, to the beginning, uh, yeah, I guess, and sort of how you got into nutrition and um, whereabouts did you grow up? Was that in California as well? Or Yeah, I'm a California native. So I grew up in what's known as the Central Coast. It's San Luis Obispo County and more specifically Paso Robles. So it's known as wine country. So it's quite a small town, even though it, it produces some of the best wines in the world. Um, and I grew up with a single mom. My dad actually passed away in a car accident when I was really young. And so my mom went to school and became a nurse and she was a total granola mom. She was a bit of a hippie. And so we had a garden in the backyard and um, eating whole and nutrient dense foods were just a part of my daily life. I didn't know any different. I mean, of course we saw things like soda and candies, they were around us and at holidays and special treats and things like that. But if I wanted something that was a sweet treat, my mom gave me like apples and peanut butter mixed with honey. And the kicker is, is that that's one of my favorite snacks to this day. So I just grew up eating a ton of whole and fresh foods and in the sunshine and going to the beach and going to the lake and just being very active and never had any health problems. It wasn't something that was really on our radar. And of course, having a mom that was a combo of both, as I said, a hippie, a granola mom and a nurse, you know, she really did her absolute best to look after us. Yeah. And then, I mean, like, so, so was it, you know, with other kids kind of eating like sweets and things like that and within your class, was that sort of something that, you know, that you can really do at home or was it, you know, you just didn't it really just think wasn't about it. in our yeah it just wasn't in our house it just wasn't a part of our day to day I mean for absolutely like at Halloween or at Christmas there were sweets and snacks around but I never had soda until I was like and I'm not even joking I was probably about 16 years old because it just wasn't it wasn't around and my mom didn't allow it she just said how bad it was for our bodies and you know and and just really instilled these really really healthy habits and that's at a young age and so it wasn't something that i reached for that i really wanted or had interest in yeah yeah interesting and then what happened like after so i'm um, uh, so then after like leaving school and you went to university um in yeah. um over there as well i mean then you know did did that change for you to sort of you know, you oh, a thousand percent. I, yeah, I was off on my own. So I started school quite young. I started at four instead of five. And so I graduated high school, uh, barely turning 17. And so when I went off to university, I was still quite young mm -hmm. and I worked in an Italian restaurant and I ate at the mess hall. And so all of these foods that I felt that maybe I'd been deprived of or just didn't have in front of my face were all of a sudden right there. So I had like fried raviolis and pizza and all the sodas and I ate ding dongs and I just ate all this junk that I hadn't had before. And I didn't think anything of it because um, you know, I just never had health problems or um, you know, I just, I, I kind of took my health for granted. So in that short span of my very first year in university, I got really sick. So I, you know, the freshman 15 is quite common for people. I put on legitimately a freshman 50 and um, I was depressed. I had digestive issues. I ended up with cystic acne and this was just in the span of one year. And so I went home that summer. And as I mentioned, my mom is a nurse and her husband, my stepdad is actually an anesthesiologist. 
And so I go home that summer and I was just like, you know what, my grades aren't doing that well. Like maybe college just isn't for me because it's not working and I'm miserable and I'm frustrated. And they were kind of looking at me and saying, you know what, whatever we've got to figure out, we're going to figure it out because girl, you are going back to school. And so with their Western medical background, right, and their belief in that system, they suggested, uh, you know, creams and pills and different things for my digestive issues and for the depression that I was experiencing. And I was like, okay, and I kind of thought about it, um, you know, and I did, I obviously took into consideration and, and their advice because they're my parents. Uh, but just by way of being home that summer and being outdoors, my, my parents actually live in Alaska. So we left from San Luis Obispo and went to Alaska. And so, you know, the summer times there are to die for. It's so green and just so beautiful and you can hike and fish and, you know, people go hunting. I'm not personally a hunter, but, um, you know, we went and we water skied and just being home and eating my mom's healthy cooking, I just started to feel better. And I was sleeping better and the, the digestive issues started slowly going away. The acne started clearing up. And so just by the end of that summer, I started to feel much better and went back to school going, okay, there's something in this that I can't keep eating this, these fried foods and this, you know, this pizza all the time and drink all these sodas. And so I just kind of got back into my original habits of you know drinking a ton of water and eating fresh fruits and fresh vegetables. And my mom kind of had this thing when we were young to eat a lot of fruit first thing in the morning because the enzymes are great for your body as soon as you wake up. So I got back into you know doing things like eating, you know, drinking smoothies. And mm -hmm. um, you know, not just it's not just having salads. Trust me, when people talk about eating healthy, it's not about having a salad every single day. It's a lot more than that. Um, and so I got back into what my body was used to and what my body thrived on. And I felt better and I lost the weight and I continued on and it did. It took me five years to complete my undergrad, which is in psychology instead of four. But, you know, that's OK. And, and I don't you know think much of it now. But at the time it was like, oh, gosh, you know, I'm behind and everything else. But it took that one year of, of getting some real life lessons to find out what I was passionate about in school, because I originally started going to school for sports medicine and sports therapy. Uh, right. And so that curriculum is intense. It's really, really hard. But I've always been passionate about helping athletes and supporting athletes on their journey and, um, and, and kids specifically on how they can set up those habits from a very young age so that they can feel their best and they can thrive in life and whatever it is that they choose to do. Nice. And, and where did you go then after? So, so, so when you graduated, what, what, what was the first kind of like career job? after after finishing like what did you do so i learned through experiences i'm a kinesthetic learner so i did not want to do any clinical psychology work i didn't want to set up a practice and go through that entire system and so when i finished college i actually moved to orange county california which is um north of here maybe by about an hour it's like 60 miles from here and I started working for a software company of all places. And I supported them with project management because I'm highly organized and I love putting structure and foundations of companies together. And so I worked for a software company for a long time and I ended up being director of operations. We moved that company to the UK. And so I was in the UK for about four years. Okay. The company got acquired by one of our biggest clients. And then I moved my daughter and I back to San Diego six, Seven years ago yeah all right nice and then was that when so w w with crystal clear kids w was that sort of like a couple of years ago when that happened or like w w when did you kind of like first think okay you wanted to then move into the whole it's like food advisory and, and nutrition side of things yeah well i think when cycles come to a completion and you're ready to take a new step in life for yourself and you really sit down and ask yourself what is it that I'm passionate about and what's my purpose and why am I here to dig deep into that? Because I see a lot of people and this is, it's super common that you're working a job that you don't necessarily love mm -hmm. and that you have a gift. We are all born with gifts to be able to help each other. And so I moved to San Diego and I actually got divorced. And so I had Isabel a hundred percent of the time. I still do. And 
as I was sitting there going, okay, well, my life was going on this path. You know, I was director of operations. I did all of these things. And when I came back to San Diego, I actually started working with a couple of different companies. And one of them uh, was an investment bank, which again, was like way far on the other side of what it is that I, that I do. Um, but it was, it was so fun and exciting to see these entrepreneurs have a dream and have an idea and then take that idea and organize it in a way that was attractive to investors. And so just by my nature, just naturally, um, I identify absolutely as a business development and a salesperson because you can be optimistic and find um, the, the key pillars of what makes a company attractive and what's gonna get traction in the market. So that kind of brought me into the whole corporate development side. But I was still sat there going, okay, but I'm really, really passionate about kids and nutrition because how I find my passion is I get frustrated and everybody finds their passion different ways. And, and people have, have asked me this a, f a few different times, you know, Crystal, how did you get so passionate about this? And I said, well, there are things that piss me off, <laughs> things that frustrate me. So if something's going to frustrate you, you either have to get over it or you have to do something about it. And so I decided to do something about it. So I stepped into the nutrition role and decided to get a couple of different certifications. Number one, as a certified master health and wellness coach, as well as a certified intuitive eating specialist. I've also done extensive training to tack on to my psychology background in parent-child interactive therapy, PCIT. And that teaches parents how to effectively communicate with their kids uh, to okay. get them on board, whether it's with healthy eating or uh, disruptive behavior, whatever it is. Uh, but it really hones parents down into to connecting with their kids on a deeper level and um, and creating more connection. So, so I got the certifications and so I just started practicing and I would work with different local schools and local uh, grocery stores where I would go and I would do talks everywhere. And I would talk with parents and say, okay, you know, your kids are dehydrated. And I looked at all the studies of kids are having a hard time focusing at school and they did a, a test. This is just an example to find out you know, if water, if them improving or increasing their intake of water would help them be more focused because their brains are actually getting dehydrated. And they found out that it was categorically um, a huge uh, resolution to some problems that kids were having in school. And so, OK, your kid doesn't like to drink water. I don't personally like the flavor of plain water myself. But what are alternatives that we can that we can include and have as a part of our daily life that aren't the things like the brands, and I won't say a brand right now, but that they have dyes in them and dyes are proven to break chromosomes. And so I just found a lot of fulfillment on a personal level of being able to work with groups of parents and work with families and adjust some things that are in their diet and as, as well as the way that they communicate with their kids uh, mm -hmm. when they have those overwhelming meltdowns and tantrums, et cetera, and go, okay, your kid's actually screaming out for help. And, and I understand we didn't get a parenting book. None of us got a parenting book, unfortunately. But there are three things that are missing when it comes to parenting and it comes to nutrition with your kids. And number one is food education. What are the right foods to feed them? Number two, feeding education, the how, the when, the where, the what quantity, the way that, to have the conversation with them uh, at mealtime, because mealtime is a point of connection. And then number three, understanding child behavior and temperament. So those are the three things that are missing, because a lot of times we have this expectation and parents have this expectation like, well, my kid should just be calm all the time. Well, that's just not reality for a number of reasons because their brains are still developing and a lot of time kids are still in their right brain which is your emotional center it's where you visualize it's where you have your imagination and that's where kids are the happiest and that part is developing and that part is is actually the strongest when they're young and your left side of your brain is your is your logic is your list is your reasoning so we have to learn how to work with our kids to integrate both sides of their brain. So when they are in the middle of this meltdown, which is right brain, their emotions are taking over, how we can work with them to slowly integrate back into their left brain. Because when they're in the middle of that chaos, it's up to us to bring them calm, not join their storm. Yeah. And and is there sort of like, I mean, methods that you kind of, that you use both in sort of coaching, like coaching the parents on 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 how to deal with that, and is it like a is it case by case sort of looking at the kids, or is it? There are a few like foundational, yeah. There are a few foundational pillars that I work with on, and and a couple of different exercises. The the program that I've created is called the Family Support Program, and it walks parents through mindset, mindfulness, and belief systems. Because when kids mm -hmm. are from the age of about one to seven years old 
they, we have different brain waves. So we've got delta where we're sleeping. We've got theta, which is our imaginative state. And that's when your subconscious, your subconscious, pardon me, is being directly programmed. And then you get up higher into the beta and the gamma waves, the alpha, delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma waves. So when your kids are actually in like the theta and alpha states, from one to seven years old. And so all of your belief systems are being created. So if you think back yourself, Ollie, to maybe a fear that you have or something that triggers you, I can bring you back. We could do an exercise together. I could bring you back to when that first belief or that first experience created that belief. And it will be between the ages of two and seven years old. I can guarantee it. So it's it's kind of overwhelming if you think about it to say, okay, as parents, you're in charge of creating your child's subconscious beliefs. And <laughs> then these subconscious beliefs carry in through adulthood. And so you're really framing and molding their mind and their mind is, 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 um, it's plastic to a certain mm -hmm. degree at a very young age. And so how can we learn how to communicate? There are you know, a few different methods. Um, and and they're, they're, they're proven, they're scientifically proven. And so what I bring parents to first and families and athletes even that I work with is saying, okay, how can we slow down and be mindful of what's happening in this very present moment? Because the past, that's already happened. The future, it hasn't happened yet. The only thing that we have influence and control over is what's happening in this very present moment right now. So if you can slow down, you'll catch where that reaction is coming from and turn that into a response and be able to respond in a way that you feel calm and comfortable and that you're not scaring your child. Yeah, interesting. That's cool. And uh, like looking into the the athlete uh, food and nutrition side of things. So you, you've, you've developed the, the food guidelines for the, for the US uh, Olympic surf team. Um, what, what did that consist of? I mean, that was that kind of like a full program or like what, what did you do for those guys? So we've done a couple of different summits and training events, and it's all been dependent on what the COVID regulations are. So we've pulled together a few mm -hmm. very safe and very fun events for them to, you know, continue to exercise and continue to, you know, hone their skills in as, as we get ready for the Olympics this summer. And it's so exciting to see surfing on the docket this summer in Japan. So the food guidelines uh, really just bring in whole foods and reduce and remove all of the toxic triggers. So there are some common toxic triggers that inflame our gut and break down our immune system. Um, so 90% of the time, if you're looking at things like corn and soy, they're genetically modified and GMOs are very toxic to our body. So if you look at kind of like the top toxic triggers, you've got corn and soy, you've got GMOs, um, Again, 90% of corn and soy are genetically modified, which actually alter our DNA and our RNA. So meaning our bodies can't absorb them as nutrients properly and they damage our yeah. system. Uh, and then things like, you know, like alcohol, that's in, and stress. Stress wrecks your immune system. So the food guidelines that I worked with the US surf team were, were very simple meals that are common day-to-day -day things, but we made them super made them with superfoods and made them with clean oils, right? So we're not using canola oil, we're not using grapeseed oil, we're strictly using either olive oil or coconut oil. We don't mm -hmm. fry anything. Um, so if you had fried rice, it would have been like, you know, sauteed or, um, you know, steamed or something like that with yes, some yummy vegetables. And instead of using things like soybean oil, um, we would use things like uh, coconut aminos because it still has that great flavor, but you're getting a ton of amino acids, which are the building blocks of protein. So I look at everything um, very holistically and it's a lot simpler, I think, than people realize to eat clean and healthy because you can mm -hmm. swap out a ton of your favorites and just cook them um, a little bit of a different way. So again, like air fryers are super popular right now. You get that crispy texture, but it's not deep fried in oil and filled with trans and saturated fats that yeah. are terrible for your system. So a lot of people have this, there's this um, misconception that, you know, you've got to, before a big event, carb load. And I don't know where that came from. I'm not quite sure where that, I call it an urban myth or a misconception. But if you if you carb load, I mean, think about it. You sit down and you eat a big plate of pasta, what happens? Yeah, you feel sleepy, right? And you want to... You're tired. <laughs> you, you can't, your body's taking all of this energy to digest this really, really heavy meal. And so to eat lighter, you know, I, I actually created a, an athlete food guideline um, 
downloadable, which is great. And I'm happy to share it with you guys as well. Uh, it depends on the time of the event. So it's really common for a lot of athletes the day of an event to be quite nervous. And where do you hold your nerves in your stomach? So if you're going to eat something really heavy, then what's going to happen? You've got your nerves on top of um, you know, this heavy meal, and then you're going to get sick before an event. So it's really common for athletes to be sick and nervous before an event. I hate to say that. I hate to say it in a way that comes across as harsh, but it's not harsh. It's, it's, it's real. And it's real mm -hmm. like that for all of us, whether you're going to get on a stage and have a chat, or you're going to be in a boardroom presenting to your board of directors, or you're getting ready for an event, your body goes into anxiety. And so it has a really hard time processing the food that you're attempting to fuel it with. Yeah. So a lot of the guidelines are just around the, you know, the event and the time of day. And then, you know, if you're going to have things like pancakes, like that's okay, but have it as a 50, 50 mix and have them lighter and have them gluten-free um, eating things like a little bit of white bread is actually okay before an event because it's, it's clean, quick fuel, and it's not going to take a long time for your body to digest it. So we really want to stay away from things like cruciferous vegetables and cruciferous are simply uh, broccolis and cauliflower and things that take a while or beans, right? Things that take a yep. long time for your body to break down and get the nutrients out of. So we just want to keep it really light is, is simply the answer. And is there a big difference then between sort of looking at foods in preparation and then looking at recovery foods? So for example, for the surfers, like whether it's between heats or whether it's that evening before before they're competing or, you know, like, like after, after they've done. So, I mean, because these events, if they go through, then it continues, isn't it? So it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's not just a one day thing. It's kind of, it's a continuation or it's a lifestyle, right? So looking at what it they is. eat before and what yeah. they eat after. Yeah. I mean, before an event, as I said, you know, if it's the night before I fed them things like, um, you know, like a, like an air fried rice uh, with, uh, you know, the cruciferous vegetables, again, the night before are fine. So some broccoli, some lean meats, right? It's all about having the lean meats, nothing that's too fatty or um, or overwhelming per se. And again, not fried. Uh, and mm -hmm. then in between heats though, you, you don't want to eat and you don't need to eat. What you need to do is replace your glycogen stores. And so you can have things like... Um, you know, there are some gels and some gel pouches that are great in between the heat just to get some quick sugar in your body, because that's actually energy and people shy away from sugar all the time. But sugar has its role and our body just needs those three things, right? It needs fat, it needs protein, and it needs sugar, which are carbohydrates. It's just about not having heavy carbohydrates and having simple carbohydrates rather than complex ones so that your body can have the opportunity to break it down and use it as fuel rather than overloading it and being and feeling sluggish, like we just said. Yeah. And what would you say, like the differences are, say between between these action sports? So whether it's, uh, you know, between skateboarding, surfing, skiing, snowboarding, whatever it may be, or you know, different different types of athletes um, and performance. You know, is there any any sort of things that differentiate the the athlete, or is it just down to the individual? Um, I, there's not a massive difference between the sports, unless you're doing something that's really jarring physically as it comes to nutrition. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, right after sport for recovery, what's great is smoothies. Um, you're getting, you know, like a plant-based milk protein for the base, uh, things like some leafy greens, um, yep. things like bananas to replace your potassium, um, getting magnesium in your system because that's a really great nerve nourishing mineral. Um, and that the, the one that goes along with that is B6. And there are a lot of great protein powders that include things like this. People just don't really, I think, look for the ingredients. And so when I recommend any type of protein powder or protein drink per se, which is fantastic for recovery immediately after you've finished an event, uh, just make sure it's got magnesium and B6, which is a cofactor, and it helps okay. your body absorb the magnesium. There's actually 90% of people that are deficient in magnesium, and there's about 70 to 80% of us, maybe even more, that are deficient in vitamin D. And those two things actually affect our energy levels. So even though I live in San Diego and there's 340 days a year of sunshine, I take a vitamin D supplement every single day um, to improve my energy levels as well as, you know, recover uh, cells recover um, from whatever it is that I'm doing. So it does come down to the individual person, though, it's hard to recommend here's one diet that's going to work for everybody, because there is no one diet that works for everybody. Um, yeah. It really depends on what their goals are when it comes to athletes, right? They want energy and they need fuel and they want to perform their best. When you're in colder climates, it's best to eat warmer things. And so I recommend things like lentil soups, 
um, are fantastic right. because you have a ton of um, there's a ton of proteins and lentils and a ton of protein in black beans, actually gram for gram black beans outweigh red meat uh, 10 times over. So they don't get enough and, 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 you know, they're not as heavy either. So they don't take as long to digest. So in colder climates, you want to eat warmer things. And then in hotter climates, you want to eat colder things. And that's just yeah. balancing. If you think about it from the Chinese uh, philosophy of balancing, you know, your yin and your yang, as well as your, you know, your life force energy, your body has to have balance. So if it's cold, you want to eat warm things. If it's hot, you want to eat cold things. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And you, you, you're also designing, um, you, you're doing some meal plans and agricultural programs as well, right? For, for some training facilities. Um, yeah. What are you working on there? Yeah, it's really exciting. So Crystal Pure Nutrition Group, we design programming for action sports facilities and for real estate developments. So everybody is looking towards fresh food. We're kind of getting back to our roots, right? The new path is an ancient one, essentially. So it comes down to the nutrient density of the soil. So the programs that I work with and the farm, the farm partner that I have actually has a regenerative, regenerative system and it's carbon negative so carbon neutral is great but carbon negative meaning we give back to the environment we're not depleting anything from it is actually the goal of what we're all looking for so with the with the the programs that i work with i instill for them and i can design for them uh, a meal plan sure this is the menu because people don't want to go anymore you know to uh to an to an active sport or a sport facility or a real estate development property and you know, things like hot dogs and nachos, and maybe at best, you know, they're getting uh, like a turkey wrap or something like that. They really want more whole fresh foods. And so we can come in and, and, and I can uh, design for them and project development and manage for them uh, a micro farm, an urban farm. We actually have the food that comes on trays uh, and they're in socks boxes. Uh oh, did it cut out? It looked like it cut out for a second. No, no, no. no. that's Not what really. happens when I talk too much. See, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so I designed for them an experience around Whole Foods, which is uh, phenomenal. And, and I think a lot of properties and the public and the market are demanding it. They don't want to go, as I was saying, just to a property and have, you know, hot dogs and nachos to, to eat after they've just had a really healthy, fun, active experience. Um, so mm -hmm. I can design the menus for them. I've done that for a number of different locations, whether it's an indoor rock climbing uh, program or an indoor surf pool things like that. Um, and so we, the properties that we work with take on both a micro farm usually because they've got to have the fresh food and the food is the easy part. It's just really designing it around it being an experience and then programming a menu that's unique to that location and that's going to draw their audience. Okay, cool. And you're also involved with like with, with the Global Action Sports Foundation. Is that part of it as well? Or what do you what's what's that all about? Yeah, so the Global Action Sports Foundation, I'm one of the founding board members, and we support well-deserving, underserved athletes get into all things action sports. So that's, you know, skateboarding, rock climbing, surfing, snowboarding, skiing. And so um, it's, you know, it's a culture and it's an industry that you're well aware of that's been underserved. And it's quite small, even though it has a massive ripple effect. And we're seeing it get a lot more attention with it coming up for the Olympics, you know, this summer, for example. And so there are a lot of kids that really want to get into it, but don't have the means and don't have access to training centers or the support. And equally, athletes that are getting out of the sport and transitioning into the normal general everyday public, you know, we support them in both ways. We get them scholarships to get into training centers so that they can excel and get better at their sport and have the potential to get on the Olympic docket, right? We just had the first, what was it a year and a half ago, the first US skateboarding team on both park and street courses, you know, get unveiled. And that was really exciting to see that and to be a part of that right here at the training mm -hmm. facility in San Diego. Um, and then again, equally getting out of, it's kind of like, okay, well, I had this great career, but my body only lasts so long. So what do I do now? And how do I capitalize on everything that I've learned and everything that I know? And how can I then pay it forward and help other people? So to transition out of action sports and get back into the world and still have, you have so much so social capital and social equity that you can share with other people. And so how do you, how do you, how do you manage that? And so we work with different groups and different training centers more specifically, as well as a handful of psychologists 
uh, mm-hmm. that, that support the athletes in getting back into the real world. And also while they're in it, you know, you've got all of a sudden got all of this fame and it can become very overwhelming. And we've seen it across a number of different uh, sports where the athletes crash just from the pressure. So how can we mentally prepare them for that? Because when I have conversations with athletes, the conversation goes, okay, so you're anxious. That's that's great. That means that you're excited. And it really all comes down to their perception. And perception is what creates our reality. So these athletes are anxious. Well, how do we take that anxiety and channel it into excitement so that they can excel and exceed when they are in the middle of that heat or you know, in the middle of of, of, of performing? Yeah. That's cool. And, and and that's based in San Diego, is that right? Or... Yes, it was created here in San Diego, but we work literally around the globe. So we just finished, actually, it was a great win for 2020. We developed a recovery center at BSR, and it was mm-hmm. the first recovery center that we've created. So it's got the ice baths based on the Wim Hof method. Uh, we've got a halo therapy uh, sauna that's there. It's the infrared therapy. We have massage tables, we've got workout tables, uh, yoga mats, the mirrors, and it all overlooks the surf pool. So it was really exciting to be able to have a center for recovery for the athletes when they finish, you know, being in the pool for a couple of hours, because it's totally different being in a surf pool. I don't know if you've been in one before yourself, Ollie, have you? Um, I have, yeah. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. Um, definitely different to, to, to being in the ocean. But, um... Yeah, in the ocean, you catch a wave, you take your time, you paddle back, you sit, you watch the sets, you're like, okay, I'll wait and I'll get another wave. No, you get right back in that lineup and you catch another perfect wave after wave after wave. You're you're blown out, exhausted when you're done. <laughs> so the recovery center was the answer to that. Cool. And and, and you're working on, I mean, with the with these uh, wave pools, I mean, they're 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 popping up all over the place at the moment. Uh, in yeah, from from um, from what I'm hearing, you like like you guys are doing quite a bit of that as well, and yeah, yeah, and it's really exciting to see it. You know, a- again, having having surfing show up in the Olympics this summer has really brought a ton of attention to action sports, is not only in the industry, but we're very protective over the culture of that and mm-hmm. making sure that it stay it has its integrity and it stays in alignment with what its purpose is, because action sports bring people together. Like skateboarding is one of the hardest sports in the world, right? And 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 historically people have looked at skateboarders as what? A bunch of thugs because they're, you know, wearing their pants saggy or, you know what I mean, they're they're tearing up the sidewalks or whatever it is. But they're athletes. They're true athletes and they deserve to have recognition for their sport. And their sport is so difficult. And it takes a ton of mental perseverance as well as patience to mm-hmm. not only learn these tricks, but to continually excel and get better at their sport. Um, so yeah, the, the real estate development projects that we're working on, we, you know, we've done BSR out in Texas where we've just put in um, a nice bowl there. It already has the surf pool and we're expanding upon that project bit by bit. We have another one that's coming up as I was sharing in the next two months uh, right here in Redlands, which isn't far from me. And uh, we have a big project in Panish that we're planning on and, and they're coming up everywhere, you know, anywhere from New Jersey, um, yeah, to New York, they're, they're, it's, it's really gaining a ton of traction. And it's such an exciting time to watch this happen and to see this industry as a whole really get the recognition that it deserves because it's easy to look at surfers and think, oh, you guys are just hanging out surfing all day. And that, you know, I feel like that came in around what the 50s and 60s when the Beach Boys were like, yeah, let's go to California and hang out at the beach. No, this is a really hard sport. And there are people that are training their tails off to get really good at it. And so now we're seeing that that shift and that change. And so it's a really exciting time to be a part of it and to and to be able to design meal plans. And not only that, but provide the food with the micro farms through Crystal Clear Nutrition Group and my farming partner to be able to fuel them after and to support them through recovery. Because recovery is a hundred percent of your success the very next day. You know, we can't just beat up our bodies. Um, and then expect them to perform the next day. We've got to give them time to rest and relax. And, you know, whether that looks like just getting a massage or rolling yourself out or drinking that smoothie that's got some chia seeds for protein and omegas or some magnesium, you know, athletes are, are using things like CBD because it's fantastic to help them kind of wind down and release some of that energy and then recuperate and be ready for the very next day. And, and what I mean, if you could give one one bit of advice, um, sort of knowing what you know now um, to athletes or 
or anyone that's sort of looking to improve their um, their eating habits or or, or, or you know um, improve their on their nutrition, what what would it be? What do you think is their kind of one thing? Or oh, there's probably multiple things, but it, what, there are there's so there? many. Um, you know, it really comes down to an individual level because we're all different. If we were all the same, it would be super weird. So a big thing that I practice and that I speak on and I teach on is the art of slowing down and being mindful. Because when you slow down and you're mindful, you know, it, it, mindfulness got a ton of attention only in the 90s when they came out and they had a TV show on mindfulness and people were a bit like, well, what's this? And again, its roots go back to, you know, ancient times of just slowing down and being and being patient with yourself and, and really the, the Zen and the Buddhist practices. And so now we're seeing them pop up a lot more because it's phenomenal. The practice of mindfulness, it reduces stress and stress, is, as I said earlier, is a massive toxic trigger. And when you slow down and you're aware of what you're doing in that present moment, you're able to see light life, pardon me, in a new light. And it can give you more hopefulness and positivity just in your mental state day to day. So I would say slowing down and just paying attention to what does my body need right now is the biggest and best advice that I can give everybody. Because if you slow down, and that's where the practice of intuitive eating comes into play, because a lot of times we're just repeating subconscious patterns or subconscious habits and being addicted to these foods when we know that if we eat it, if we eat these fried raviolis or pizza like I did, I'm going to feel terrible. However, this is just something that I survive on and I eat every single day. So how do we draw a line in the sand and just slow down just by being mindful? And that can be as simple as uh, there's breathing practices and they're across the spectrum uh, in a number of different ways. There's, you know, every, everybody from the Navy SEALs to Buddhist monks to just breathe in for four and breathe out for four and literally just do that three or four times and it will center you and get you into the present moment because where we want to create consciously is in the present moment and is in stopping ourselves. But unfortunately where we are living is in our subconscious mm -hmm. program, which is operating 95% of the time. So the only way to create a new subconscious habit or to reprogram your subconscious is to slow down and stop in the moment that you're in. And whether that's to ask yourself, why am I frustrated right now? Why am I stressed right now? What's going on? Or why am I craving this food? Or what do I really want to eat right now? Rather than just mindlessly you know, reacting to situations out of stress and frustration, which is just an old habit, or mindlessly, you know, eating a bunch of foods that aren't the best for us. And I believe that food doesn't need to be strict and clean all the time, because we're meant to enjoy food, right? But you can enjoy and you can change your taste buds once you've cleaned up your gut. You can enjoy things like crispy kale chips if it, you know with nutritional yeast on them or snack on dates for sweetness um but if you also equally want to eat some ice cream like by all means don't deprive yourself just slow down and ask yourself how do i want to feel right now and the answers that you get they might surprise you but if you can start to follow that and follow that road and and again just slow down and notice when you're walking oh look at there's the grass and there's the birds and there's a car to just bring yourself down um, again, will will absolutely and categorically change your life. And when and and it's also known as a state of flow. So athletes are chasing a state of flow. And, and I think you can agree with me on this, right? To get into that moment where you're just um, just just performing. And so all the work that 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 is done leading up to that, right? Whether it's obviously the training and the weightlifting and the exercising and the practicing, you you can't prepare yourself enough. Um, and, and when you get into that moment and you're actually riding that wave, none of, you're not thinking about any, any of that, are you? You're in that present moment. And yeah. so all the visualization practices and all the techniques have just prepared you to be in that moment. But when you're in that moment, you're in flow because you're in the present moment. Yeah, that's true. It's trying to just, just to be in that flow. And then, yeah, hopefully, you know, all, all the preparation for, for body and mind is kind of, yeah, a line of that time, right? Um, yeah. That's cool. Um, what's the best way for, for people to get in contact with you or if they want to follow what you're up to uh, with, with Crystal Clear Kids? What's uh, how's the best way? Yeah, so I'm active on social media. I have a podcast. It's called Clean Eating for Kids, and you can find it on Spotify and YouTube and Google Play and all of them and Deezer. Um, and then I'm also on Facebook. Everything's Clean Eating for Kids, bar crystalclearnutritiongroup.com. Uh, which is where I work with the real estate development projects and 
and, and excelled in that area of providing the micro farms and project planning and design for improving, you know, nutritional offerings on properties. Uh, but the work that I do with kids that I'm really passionate about and families is improving their relationships through food and mindfulness and how we can really prepare kids for, for their future. And because the habits that they create now, as we've just been discussing, right? They're subconsciously programmed, um, lead into future and can lead into future issues. And so how is we as parents, how can we support them and nurture them and set them up for a, a successful future? Nice. Good stuff. Well, yeah, we'll definitely be keeping keeping an eye out with, with all the projects going on. And uh, yeah, I hope, hope uh, everything goes well this year. Yeah, thanks, Ollie, for having me. It's really great to see you as always. Cool. Thanks, Chris. See you later. Yeah.